Hi, I'm Dr. Tuccio, the Chart Doctor, and this is Episode 6, where we're going to talk about teardrop course reversals. You know what a course reversal is. You usually think of it as a procedure turn, but there are other kinds of course reversals. Let's look at those. Well, you know what they are. They have a procedure turn. We have a hold in lieu of a procedure turn. We have a DME arc. And we have the teardrop. That's the focus of what we're going to talk about today. When you look at these, we know how to do, and we, there's a good body of knowledge in the Instrument Flying Handbook, the Instrument Procedures Handbook, as well as the AIM on how to do a procedure turn, a hold in lieu of a procedure turn, and a DMER. What there's very little, if anything, on is how you're supposed to do a teardrop course reversal. When you show this to most people for the first time, they think that they can do a standard rate turn and you can see the fallacy of that here at Gallup, where if you did a standard rate turn, it just won't work because you can, you'll can you see as we go on that this has to be done within 10 nautical miles on this particular procedure. And, and that means you could start it anywhere you like. And obviously, a standard rate turn can't work at all those different places. All you find in the FA Instrument Procedures Handbook on a teardrop course reversal is this sentence here, that you're supposed to fly certain things along their procedural track exactly as depicted. Honestly, I don't know how you're supposed to comply with that exactly as depicted. Let's see. So when we look uh, real quick, this is more material in the Instrument Procedures Handbook. Look, we know there's a lot of stuff on how to do a procedure turn, on how to do a, a holding course reversal, how to do a DME arc. All you get for is this one little diagram in the Instrument Procedures Handbook that shows the teardrop, but it doesn't really tell you anywhere how to execute the lobe. And the lobe is far from trivial. Let's see if we can illuminate what we're talking about by looking at these um, teardrops compared to flight management system depictions. Here is Stafford. And this particular database provider went and shows a perfect load. So if you have the benefit of the FMS, which most of us do today, granted, this might be a little bit of an esoteric discussion, but if, if you had to fly this, remember, this ILS can be flown without any FMS. It's supposed to be able to be flown just by conventional equipment. And that means you don't have this benefit. If you have this benefit, well, you're going to fly this arc. In fact, you might even get... Um, uh, CDI coverage dependent. You might even get a CDI like you would for a DME arc as you go through that lobe from high gap to a fui. But let's look here at Dodge City. Dodge City, you're supposed to go out to O and J, take a left turn, and then intercept the, the final. When you look at this in an FMS, whoa, they tell you O and J, intercept something, and then go to where I'm, and then come in. That's a little bit confusing, and of course it's a 90 degree intercept too. So how you work that out in practice, the FMS doesn't necessarily help you here. Now we get to Gallup. Here what I did on Gallup is I'm going to show you, I found two different database providers and how they show it in the FMS. The first one doesn't have any lobe. It's not a 90 and they just had you do a 30 uh, degree intercept at, and start at seven miles. That's great. Well, seven was just made up and to help you do the turn and find the turn point to stay within 10 nautical miles, which you can see in the profile view. The other database provider went to eight and then they showed it as, an, as a lobe, as a nice arc to go and intercept. So um, your FMSs will represent these differently is the, is the uh, moral of the story. Let's go look at a couple more without the FMS and drill into them when we look at the profiles. So here we have Dodge City and Dodge City we've looked at, and you can see that, what do they say? Go out to O and J, and teardrop left turn, and then turn inbound. It seems to imply that you need to stay within the DME arc. How, because how big can that lobe be, right? That lobe that you do between O and J and the intercept is, how big can it be, right? Um, so let's look here at the next one. The next one that we're looking at here is in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Here the teardrop goes outside the DME arc. 
So how big the lobe can be, and all it says is there's a teardrop left turn. It doesn't stay remain within or anything. I guess it just sort of assumes that you're going to do the, the uh, lobe between Neta and the intercept efficiently. Here we come out, and we're starting to get used to these. We have a teardrop right turn. We come out, and here they have the, the um, computer navigation fix, the CNF, CFPGS, right next to Husker, apparently identifying the end of the lobe, although that's not on the profile view. So these take a little bit of thought process, and you don't want to be surprised by these, and that's why you are here listening to this presentation. When we look here at Gallup, we see that there is no distance outbound. As I mentioned before, all we get is in the profile view that you need to remain within 10 nautical miles. So you need to, as a pilot, use your judgment as to when you're going to turn. If you turn too early, you might screw up your um, intercept of the Kinley outer marker. And in, if you turn too late, you might violate the 10 nautical miles. So here, what I'm going to do is show you my personal technique for these. It is not authoritative. It's just what I do. So let's focus on the plan view. And my, I, I'll break this down into three steps. The first step is turn 90 degrees to the final approach course, 236 degrees. So in this case, okay, 90 degrees relative to the final approach course. You could make that 90 relative to the outbound 356. I chose, in this case, to use 236, I used 236, which is 90 relative to the inbound. You could see you could pick that anyway, because nothing is, the FAA hasn't trained us how to do this. They haven't given us any literature. Step two is I wait a little bit. That's a little judgment, because it might depend. If I'm going into a headwind, I'll wait a little longer. If I got a tailwind behind me on this part of the segment, then I'm going to uh, not, not, not wait as long, if any. Step three, pick up a 33 intercept to the final, in this case, 176 degrees, and finish it up. That'll give me plenty of time to intercept. Again, that's just a personal technique. Well, I'm Dr. Tucci of the Chart Doctor. I hope this has helped illuminate the teardrop course reversals in case you come across one in your flight.